Hello friends, my name is Michelle Fondon and I'm the author of Help! I Think My Loved One is an Alcoholic, a survival guide for lovers, family, and friends. Today I'm going to talk to you about how can I help my alcoholic loved one to get sober. After you learn the definition of alcoholism and what an alcoholic is, and once you realize that your loved one is an alcoholic, the first and foremost thing that must be on your mind is, how can I help my alcoholic loved one get sober? It is a thought that often obsesses each and every loved one of an alcoholic. This obsessed me too. I tried everything I possibly could to help him get sober, to help him have this awakening, and to help him realize that he really needed to get help and that if he didn't, he would most certainly die of alcoholism. Learning that your loved one is an alcoholic is devastating news. Really coming to the realization in yourself and overcoming your own denial that your loved one is in fact an alcoholic can be a really rude awakening. It may have been going on for years or even decades and you just looked at the behavior as something of normal life circumstances or you looked at it as, well, you know, my mom is really just a heavy drinker and she has five cocktails or five glasses of wine every night before she goes to bed and passes out in bed. And so we make these excuses because alcoholism is covered in denial. And that denial really affects us as people who love alcoholics as well. It really surrounds us. The disease is so evasive, elusive, baffling, confusing, because sometimes you see a normal person behaving in a normal way, and then bam, something happens, and then you see this person who behaves completely different, and you're blindsided, and you have no idea what just happened. That's the disease of alcoholism, let me tell you. So there are three ways in which you can really help your alcoholic loved one potentially get better. Now remember, this is always a potential. The other person, even if they are very sick, they have their own free will choice. Each person has his or her own free will choice and we can't do anything to try to take away that other person's free will choices. And as hard as it may seem, as hard as it may feel, as hard as it may be inside of you, to accept this, that is the truth. If your alcoholic loved one is an adult over the age of 18, he or she has free will choices, even to stay in his or her addiction. So the first thing you can do to help your alcoholic loved one is to have a discussion or talk with him or her. Now this can sometimes be tricky to do, this can be a very humbling experience in yourself. And this is often done in the initial stages of alcoholism or in the initial stages of your discovery of your loved one's alcoholism. Now this is very delicate and it must be handled with kid gloves. Think about yourself not as being someone who really loves this person who is an alcoholic, but think of yourself as someone who might be an HR coordinator in a large corporation. So if you are the HR coordinator or manager in a huge corporation and the alcoholic loved one is an employee in your large corporation, you would handle the situation very different than if the person was a loved one. So you need to set yourself up for that mindset. You need to set yourself up for, I need to take a few steps back and look at myself as almost a neutral party with compassion and interest in that person's well-being, but a neutral party that if we part ways, it's okay. If we stay close, it's okay. And so an HR person who's presenting the problem to an employee will be very poised, hopefully, <laughs> will be very poised, will state the facts very simply, will state the outcome very simply, and will give some sort of reasoning or ultimatum. But the ultimatum needs to be measured, if you will. 
So sometimes the first thing that happens when an employee does something that's against company policy would be to give a verbal warning or to, to state the facts and give a verbal warning. And you might do this one time, two times, and maybe the third time would be the ultimatum or you need to clean up your act, so to speak, <laughs> or else you're fired. But they're going to say it in a very diplomatic manner. And this is really hard because we are so emotional in this disease because it's a very emotional disease. I'm sure you've been hurt many times over by your alcoholic loved one's behaviors and actions um, and words. I'm sure that there has been ongoing times of, of things happening that were just beyond your control. And so you're very emotionally attached to this person and you're very emotionally attached to what's happening with this person in your life. So let's look at this. So you might say something like, um, like I would say to my alcoholic loved one, look Johnny, um, I've noticed that on an increasing basis, every night you're finishing a bottle of wine every night before you go to sleep. And then I'm noticing that on the weekends you're drinking four or five martinis starting at 11 a.m. and then passing out by 7 p.m or that I'm not able to have um, a conversation with you midday on a Saturday. Or I've noticed that you haven't gone to your son's soccer game, or I haven't no I've noticed that you haven't showed up for the school play. So you're just stating the facts right here. Now what's gonna happen is, as soon as you present the facts, your alcoholic loved one is going to start making excuses or justifying the behavior, or justifying the experiences, or flat out denying it. Just be prepared that that is what is going to happen. Remember this, your alcoholic loved one may be sick. Your alcoholic loved one may be completely wrapped up in his or her alcoholism, but alcoholics are usually highly sensitive people and they're not stupid, meaning that they have a knowledge within themselves, they have this cognizance that something is way off here and they know it. They know what they're doing, even though many of it, many of the experiences may be in a blackout. For the most part, they're pretty cognizant about what's going on, even though they don't completely understand it. But because of the illness, they're defending it. So hence the baffling aspect of the disease. So the first thing you're probably going to do is just present the facts. Say, look, I've noticed this, this, and this. And then, you know, if the alcoholic loved one decides to defend themselves, say, you know what? No need to defend. I'm just making you aware. Walk away. Second time, same thing. Present the facts. This, 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 and this. Just making you aware. Walk away. The third time around that this happens, you can make the decision within yourself if you feel comfortable to set a course, set a course of action, set an ultimatum. So I know, for example, that one um, grandmother who was an alcoholic, her daughter said, mom, I love you. I love that you spend time with the kids, but I can't handle the drinking. So if you have a visit with the grandkids, you cannot take them in a car anymore. So that would be the ultimatum. The ultimatum is, I love you, I'm aware of the drinking, and this is gonna happen. And then you follow through. You follow through what, with what you say you are going to do. So that is the most important part of this whole scenario, is that think about yourself as an HR person in a corporation again. So if you said, Bob, we've noticed that you've come late to work half an hour each day for five days. We would advise you that work starts at nine o'clock. We expect everyone to be at their desk on, at, at or before nine o'clock. Please show up on time. That's it, conversation done. You've stated the facts. You said what time work starts, okay. The second time you talk to Bob, he continues to show up late. And you say to him, Bob, we spoke about this before. Work starts at 9 a.m. It's really important that all the employees be here at 9 a.m. Could you please make an effort? Be here at 9 a.m. Third time around, <laughs> Bob, we've talked to you about this. The behavior continues and you haven't given us a justified reason as to why you continue to show up late to work. I'm sorry, we're gonna have to let you go. 
and then you follow through. So the same thing for you when you talk to an alcoholic loved one, make sure you're following through with what you say you're going to do. The second thing you can do to help your alcoholic loved one is to do an intervention. Now I'm not going to go into too much detail about a family intervention in this video because it is a very lengthy process and it is one in which you need to prepare and if you don't prepare properly, it can certainly backfire on you. We tried a family intervention with Johnny. He sat and listened to the intervention for about two hours, was very calm, quiet, and collected, but Ultimately, it didn't really work and it sort of did backfire and we had really prepared for a long time before we did this family intervention. So to give you a brief description, an intervention is when three or more loved ones come together and sometimes you have a psychologist, a therapist, an addiction specialist, or a professional interventionist come in and you prepare letters to read to the alcoholic loved one. Usually these are letters about your experiences with the alcoholic loved one, but it is done with love. It is done with compassion. It is done with awareness. There's really no blame. There's no shaming. There's no guilt trips that you're laying on the alcoholic loved one. We're really talking about helping the person who suffers from the disease of alcoholism to bring to light the disease of alcoholism, to have that light bulb go on in his or her head, and to get them immediate help into recovery. So that is the end goal of an intervention. Again, it takes some time to prepare. I would say do not do an intervention if you're going to do it on, just do it on the fly. It really needs good preparation. And the reason why you need three or more people is that an alcoholic is extremely good at argumentation and they're really good at casting off one person against the other because they've had practice and they've had experience at protecting the disease. So they will always try to deflect the attention from themselves onto somebody else. The more people that are present, the more difficult it is for the alcoholic to do this. And that's why you really need a fair amount of people in that room to help bring to light the disease of alcoholism without the alcoholic going into ultra defense mode and deflecting the energy from him or her back onto the other people. There's a really great book called Love First, A Family's Guide to an Intervention. I would say you should check it out if that's what's interesting to you to do and if you feel compassionate and passionate to help out your alcoholic. The third thing that you can do, and I created an entire video on this, is to stop enabling. So enabling, as I mentioned, it's not a word that I enjoy. I don't like the word enabling, but it is a word that's used in this disease. And so really look to yourself as to your own behaviors in this relationship. As I mentioned, it's a social disease, so it's also a disease of relationship. So look to yourself and look at what things do you do to enable your alcoholic loved one. Look to the video called Enabling or Caring in my video series. You can really get a full explanation of what enabling is all about. But for example, we're talking about taking care of your alcoholic loved one who is an adult as if they were a child. Your alcoholic loved one is an adult if they are over 18 they can take care of themselves. And if they can't take their care of themselves, that's a good thing because then they can come to the realization that the disease has gotten so far out of control that they need to do something to change it. It includes giving your alcoholic money, giving them a ride, giving them a car, a home, a place to stay, buying them food, cooking food, doing their laundry, taking their stuff to the dry cleaning. Anything that they need to do for themselves as a functional adult, you need to stop doing. And that includes begging, pleading, looking at them, telling them what to do, how to recover, how to get through this. You need to make them aware of the facts. Do it in a very calm manner, but it's up to them to get help into recovery. If they ask you for your help, if they say, I need to get to an AA meeting, will you bring me? That is not enabling. That is assisting them into their own recovery. So if you say, sure, I will, I will drive you to the AA meeting, there are plenty of people there. And in every AA meeting, just know this, in every AA meeting, they have people that will come and get you to take you to meetings. 
And so it's a service-based organization. So there are the recovering alcoholics that are in AA meetings are volunteers for the most part in every position of service, including picking up an alcoholic who wants to recover and taking them to meetings. So you can take your alcoholic loved one to his or her first meeting, and then let them network, let them get a sponsor, let them take charge of their own sobriety and take charge of their own recovery. So I thank you so much and I hope this video has helped you learn how you can help your alcoholic loved one. God bless.